Hello, everyone. I am Christy Oliver, the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Today, we are thrilled to have a fantastic panel of Art21 educators to share their wisdom about incorporating contemporary art into middle school art classes. A few quick housekeeping items before we begin. We would really love for you to ask questions throughout our time together. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or use the Q&A button, both of which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring these throughout the session and we'll get to as many questions as we can during our time together. Also, just a reminder that we are recording this session and after we finish today, a link to the video will be emailed to you and will be available for viewing at davisart.com slash free resources. We'll hear from the panel in just a minute, but before we do, I'd also like to introduce Emma Nordine, Manager of Education Initiatives at Art21. Together, we'll be moderating the session. So in addition to the panelists, you'll also be hearing from myself and Emma today. Emma, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It's snowing here in New York, so I'm really excited that you all are here and not frolicking out of the snow or whatever weather it is where you are. Um, Christy, should I cue off our wonderful teachers and they can start? Yes. Yeah. So my wonderful teachers, my educators, do you all want to say hi? You want to start with Amber? Hi, I'm Amber Arnold, and I am um, the Fine Arts and instructional coach in Gwinnett County um, in Atlanta, Georgia. I am Jennifer Bockerman. I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I currently teach middle school and work with curriculum development for the district. Hi folks, I'm Joe Fusaro. I teach uh, art in Nyack, New York, uh, just north of New York City, and I work with uh, Emma at Art21. Hello, I'm uh... Alex Mendez, I teach um, in Chicago Public Schools, uh, elementary school K through eight, but I, so I teach all grade levels. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here today. After providing a framework for what we mean by contemporary art, our panelists will address some questions um, teachers often ask about incorporating contemporary art and practices into their teaching contexts. From there, we'll conduct a question and answer session. So please, again, type any questions you have in the chat box or use the Q&A function so we can discuss them um, at the allotted time. We'll also provide a quick overview of the free resources offered by both Davis Publications and Art21. And we'll finish the session with the panelists sharing their top five contemporary artists to use in your, in your middle school classroom. And now I will turn it back over to Emma. Great, thanks, Christy. Uh, so first, we want to start by defining our major term today, which is contemporary art. So Art21 defines contemporary art as the work of artists who are living in the 21st century. So that's after the year 2000. Uh, Davis wants to add on that it frequently pushes boundaries between genres and experiments with new processes and ways of making. And it is distinguished from previous periods when, even though they were also contemporary, because they're happening for those artists, uh, contemporary art today is insightful in its focus on personal, cultural, and societal issues like never before. So with that, let's dive into our question and answer with our teachers. And our first question is, what does contemporary art allow you to do in the classroom? Jennifer, you wanna kick us off? It's a great question to start with. And I would say contemporary art allows an entry point for all students because it explores contemporary life where we are now. It replicate, um, contemporary artists aren't relegated to just simple still lifes and portraits with one media, but instead are tasked with examining the world and providing a lens through which to pull it into focus. So it's about real and relatable topics for our students today. Contemporary art is also interdisciplinary as artists explore soil chemistry, gene editing, microbes, relationships, societal issues, power structures, identity, and so forth. And it casts this really wide net to invite students into the conversation surrounding these contemporary topics. It allows a space for connection making and a place for meaning making in the art studio for our students. It provides them a new language for an impactful and more far reaching communication of their findings. So if we have students who are interested mostly in say science and eventually they go on to publish in a scientific journal. Well, how many people 
what percentage of the population might have access to that um, type of journal compared to the access they might gain to being able to communicate through visual means um, on a global scale. So we get some interest there as well. Contemporary art also helps uh, promote diversity as students see themselves reflected. It's really amazing um, when we experience, have the experience of seeing a student flip on like a light switch once they see an artist who looks like them or has had a similar experience to them or lingers in a concept to which they also display care for. Um, and identity and identity within a group are big topics for middle school students. Who am I and what is my role within these various groups? Um, so they become engaged as they see themselves reflected and also as they can view themselves through these new lenses and a new context. Um, Carrie James Marshall explores how we might merge our past and our present to continue our cultures into the future. And he does this by merging African mythology with pop culture comics, also a big hit with our middle schoolers. And he asks some really deep questions about what is preserved for the future. So here a grade student, a grade six student has worked with um, mixed media to create almost a portrait of sorts, but the face is completely darkened out and there's a headdress on on the figure and the, um, a contemporary city in the background and this um, sun that might be setting or rising. Um, and he's considered how his cultural identity is not merging, but is in contrast to pop culture identity and how this leaves him in this space of ambiguity for right now. What should be carried into the future as he also starts to explore this broad concept that Carrie James Marshall has brought to us. Next slide. Thank you. Contemporary art also presents various perspectives for our students. So in Nick Cave's decorative cages, caves, or dwellings embodying these ceramic dogs, it beckons us to consider discarded items, symbolism in Western art, and social status. Uh, this idea of excess and value. He presents us with multiple options for entry points and in interpretation of the work. So it's an opportunity for us to model for our students how to have a respectful conversation around opinions and to be aware of different people's different experiences that they bring to the table. Students engage in generative thinking across um, cross-cutting themes. So students begin to explore and share their own passion topics from various disciplines, geology, robotics, oceanography, fashion, through this lens of um, access, power, parts of a whole micro macro systems, these, these really big interdisciplinary concepts that they're seeing come up in lots of different classes and in their lives. And they become more actively engaged in the world, noticing and then returning with resources and artifacts or information for each other for each other's topics. So it's really cool to see this classroom of positive interdependence start to develop. Students explore their identity. So like Carrie James Marshall, um, this student's mixed media piece for eighth grade, she's exploring her identity within a group. So she explored her heritage and how their dwellings as a noun we're taking refuge, refuge from the elements, but also how she dwells now today as a verb, taking refuge in an entirely different set of elements. And lastly, contemporary art allows us a lens to look at the world from various perspectives, a new way to consider what we believe, maybe adjust our own thoughts, and maybe even our actions. Alex, I would like to ask you the question, what do middle school students need that contemporary art can give? Thank you, Jennifer. That's a great question. Um, so uh, approaching uh, middle school students with contemporary art um, can be kind of challenging at times. Um, but there's a couple of things that I like to, uh, different approaches that I like to take with them to, in order to get them to really um, try to think a little differently and, and really challenge them. Um, so um, I like to make sure that they understand that creativity um, and expression is more than just a simple thing of drawing, because that's a lot of what I feel um, happens with them, like they come in with that kind of mindset. Um, also to think about that, um, to be an artist or to make art, you don't have to use the same kind of materials and tools that you normally see. And here is a good example with Brian Jungen. Um's work who he took um, a lot of these Air Jordans um, 
that he then repurposed into making them to masks that were similar to the Pacific Coast um, native peoples. Um, so there's sort of this way that, you know, he kind of takes shoes that are like worth hundreds of dollars um, in some cases and pretty rare to find and he cuts them up. And every time you show students that they kind of look at it like, are you serious? Like, that's insane. Why is he spending this money and cutting the shoe up? But then when they see the art that he's making, it kind of really helps them kind of contextualize what's happening and maybe think a little differently. Um, the other way is that kind of that and along the same lines is thinking about new ways of making and interacting with art is that it's not just necessarily about making something and putting it up and then having people respond to it, but maybe that there is something that um, you do with the art or that happens that makes you engage with the art or causes you to do something else in order to be a part of the art. And with that, um, I also like to make sure that um, I, I let students know that uh, it can be very personal and it can be about what they want or what they're interested in. Because most of the times, especially with middle school students, they just kind of think that, you know, they should, be, they should be able to draw or paint a certain way and everything should be realistic. And then if they can't do that, they're, they're not successful. And so in this situation, I like to say, look, it can be about things that you really care about and that you're really interested in. And then find those ways or those artists to that, you know, inspire you to kind of tap into that. Um, and then in there, also that, that art is all, the contemporary art can also be very much about experience and participation so that it's, you know, it can be you are engaging someone else, you are asking someone something or you are making someone do things or making them, you know, get into these different situations um, that they may not normally be get into or do. Um, and then the, also the, fi the, the final thing that I have on here is thinking about um, the idea of process versus product, which um, a lot of students feel like when you make art or in your art class, you have to make something at the end. And then once you make it, you're like, okay, I got my grade. Or they may ask you, okay, you know, I, I got my work back. Here's my grade. And then on their way out of the door, they're just like, okay, garbage. And then they leave and then they're like, that's it. Instead of it being something where they're thinking through, hey, you know, I, I'm learning, I'm exploring, I'm discovering, I'm figuring these things out. Um, and it's about doing all of that work before the end comes out. Sometimes that, that I think is, is a pretty interesting approach because students, it, it really challenges students to think very different. Um, next slide, please. So here's a couple of different artists where you see some of these things. Um, uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, where it's basically candy in a corner. And when people, when I show students this artist, because he has a lot of different things that he does, it's sort of like they have to really stop and think like this is art or this can be art or this is something that you have to participate. So you're going into this and you take a piece of candy, why? And you read the information and the description and it says, you know, this is the, the weight of a past lover and now you are a participant, you are taking that and it's sweet. So that, that memory is lingering and going on um, in your mind, but it, it continues, it just keeps going and keeps going. Um, so I think that's, I really like this artist and, and using that, using him to get students to think uh, outside the box. Next slide, please. And then these are two other artists. These two are artists are actually in our R21 artists and um, Glenn Ligon, I love to use his work with middle school students because he uses text and his approach is to take text where he uses other people's words. He has a thing in the video, one of his segments where he says, you know, I'm not really interested in saying something that like my own thing, he's like, I'm more interested in what other people have already said and how they um, take the, and how I use their words and kind of, you know, do different things with them. So I think that that's also a thing that helps students really see like, oh, I can make art with words and text and songs and music and lyrics and all these other things. And so I think that's a, 
that's a pretty like accessible approach to students because you know everyone can write or at least everyone can copy so that there, there's a way that i kind of bring that in there and then the other thing doris salcedo her thing is really emotional and here's something where she cut the floor at the tate and it's sort of like a scar like it's just sitting there so it's a very personal emotional thing that you have to kind of really get into but it makes students stop and kind of really reflect and that's also a reason why i like to use her work next slide please and then this one is uh thinking about the point earlier where talking about how thing art can be made with um from students perspective their lives this is a student work where they we're talking about kind of like their whole overall experience of just being a, a student or teenager in school. Um, she's an eighth grade student and she decided to kind of take a piece of pants of hers that she would use to make it look like it's, you know, a, a real person. But on the other side is this sculpture that she made. Um, and so on the next slide, you can see some of the details. So like she was talking about like she was really into, into graffiti but the view that graffiti is given is like a very negative, you know, not, not a fine art thing. So she wanted to highlight that as being like a really important part of who she is. And that's why she put it at the top. And then next to that kind of like living in a city, you see these buildings, you know, this is just sort of a, a reality. It might not necessarily look like a place that you may wanna live, but that is where she lives. Um, and then on the next slide, you see like some of the realities of living in a city where there's gentrification happening, meaning you know, on the left, all this construction and, and those kinds of situations. But then on the right, you see a bus and that is like um, you know, how students get around in the city. You are always on the bus or on the train or something along those lines. Um, and then on the final slide, you see sort of like a little bit more personal uh, situation where, the city doesn't look the best. It's kind of, the, those pieces are supposed to be floating in space. They're hanging from string, it's hard to see them, but kind of like this place is on fire. You know, you're living in a city, there's a lot of danger in kinds of those kinds of views. But then over to the right, you see actually like an altar. So someone dying or, or a remembrance of that. So all of those things kind of, um, really kind of all came together on, you know, this one student's uh, work. So yes, next slide, I think. Oh, yes. So I have a question for Joe. So Joe, what are the challenges of utilizing, utilizing contemporary art with middle school students? Thanks, Alex. And thanks to everyone again for, uh, for joining us today. Um, when I thought about this, uh, this question that Alex just asked, you know, um, you know, what are the biggest challenges we might face when it comes to teaching contemporary art and using contemporary art with middle school students? The first thing that came to my mind is all about the front end work that we've got to do, um, preparing students for what they're going to see in advance, giving them a chance to think about uh, some of the content, perhaps, in advance, so that they're ready to engage with it instead of surprising uh, these guys with uh, with something that they might not expect. You know, uh, students who come to an art class, especially in middle school settings, and every day they're making art at tables one day after another, um, suddenly a teacher after, you know, a long period of doing this wants to put up a film and and, and talk about uh, contemporary art. Uh, they're making it hard on themselves by, by surprising them. Adults don't like surprises and kids don't like it either. So I think that one of the things that I, I try to remember as often as I can is, you know, let me preface the next class, let me build a bridge to the next class so that they're able to think a little bit uh, about what we're gonna do and what we're gonna see together. You know, if we're gonna uh, look at some work by, for example, Robin Road, who collaborates with uh, with other um, other people in his work to make the photographs and create this uh, very public art that Robin creates with uh, his assistants and co-creators uh, in Johannesburg. Um, I want them thinking about street art. I want them thinking about uh, even places where they they find um, geometry and art coming together. 
Um, but I want to give them a heads up uh, in advance and ask them to take note of things that they might see in the building and in their community before we come in and, and look at a film together. And the second thing I put is that, you know, for me, I, I want to make sure that I select artists that are really speaking to what the students are experiencing, the kinds of things that they're um, not only interested in, but the kinds of things that I think will provoke them in a way to think about others um, and think about, um, you know, we do a lot of work with our students where they're thinking a lot about themselves, but we also in the middle school level want students to be thinking about others. Um, who uh, can they uh, help, for example? Who might um, need um, their assistance in some way? Or who, you know, who else lives in their own community that they don't even know very well? Um, so you want to, you know, try to select artists that are really speaking to not only their concerns, but what we want them to learn and artists that will engage them uh, visually as well as uh, through their words. And then the, the last uh, point I have here, and, um, and it connects to uh, some stuff we'll talk about a little later in the, uh, the session here, is just getting students used to looking at art in order to get great ideas. Um, I think if we can strike a balance in our classrooms where we are creating a community um, where students are used to um, making and thinking, uh, looking and uh, creating different kinds of things, um, you know, having discussions as well as uh, planning and, um, and engaging in projects with us, um, that kind of balance uh, makes it a lot easier for all of us to share contemporary artists, to put uh, films on in the classroom, to have a discussion that then really kicks off something interesting versus a lot of the stereotypical responses we might get to visual problems that we, we share with our students. So Robin Road is definitely one artist I've been teaching with uh, recently, featured in season nine of Art in the 21st Century. And in the next slide, I also had a couple of other artists that uh, would be great for, for middle school teachers. Uh, whoop de doo is a lot of fun. We've uh, done a couple of films with whoop de doo um, at Art 21, as well as a new artist we're working with, Elisa Niesenbaum, who um, uh, is a great painter uh, and has painted um, uh, beautiful portraits that really uh, span uh, cultures, especially um, the, um, the um, uh, Mexican uh, immigrants that she has worked with uh, in order to create some of the, the, the portrait work that she's, she's doing now. Um, we're gonna also talk about some, some of our top artists later in the, in the session, but I, I wanted to highlight Robin Road and whoop de doo and, and Aliza's work um, to, uh, to just kick things off a little bit. So Amber, I'm, uh, I'm also kind of wondering, uh, you know, what do you hope students will learn uh, in our courses, especially your, your courses. Thanks, Joe. Um, well, to, I guess, build on and summarize what everyone has already said, um, these two student works um, kind of show what I hope and what we hope that our students learn. So in this project, um, my students were exploring and learning about the work of Radcliffe Bailey, who is a local Atlanta artist, and he uh, uses his personal history and mark making and symbolism to explore how his past informs his present and what he's experienced and who he is today. And so my students were exploring their personal identities and we were looking through the art skill lenses of color schemes, mark making, um, value, and even traditional and non-traditional tools that we can use to make a physical mark in our artwork. Um, but we also explored the ideas of how artists make a mark and tell their stories. And so these, these two student images um, really summarize what we hope our students learn in our courses. We hope that they walk away um, having explored 
big ideas and um, explored how to express their ideas and their personal identities. We hope that they learn critical thinking and problem solving skills and that they really participate in the um, inquiry process and art making as research and critical thinking. Um, we also hope that they learn those critical art skills, the elements of art, um, the principles of design, but through the process of art making and not as isolated skills. And then um, we also hope that our students um, learn to be comfortable with creative risks and taking creative risks, um, exploring their own creativity, whatever their art form may be, whether it's visual art or another art form, but we hope that our students are comfortable with that creative risk taking. Next slide, please. Um, so this is another example of the student work on the far right. And then the two images, I guess the middle image and the left image are both Radcliffe Bailey's work um, where he uses mark making as symbols and um, actual photographs of his ancestors in his work to really explore his personal histories. All right, so thank you so much to all of our panelists. We have some questions for you. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free to type any questions you have in the chat box or you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll start with a question um, for anyone on the panel who would like to answer. For teachers who are struggling to provide students with choice, if it's hard for the teacher to do that, do you have any suggestions about how to begin? Yes. So um, usually with, so what I find, so what I've found to be very helpful with students when, especially if like you're, you're really resistant to trying, um, to, to give them the, the freedom to sort of pick and choose what they want to do. Um, usually I like to kind of start out with um, uh, trying to get like several different things that you, they could work with. So like if you say we're going to go and stick to the idea of just 2D materials and say we're going to do painting materials, drawing or collage and then letting them kind of pick from those available materials to work with. It gives them the choice of saying, well, I'm not really good at drawing, but I can put a collage together or I can kind of figure out a, a way to work with all of those in some way so that there isn't, I guess the issue would be there is less restrictions on it in terms of what you would assume or would want them to have. At the same time, also exposing them to like just a variety of different artworks and artists, I think helps them really kind of like pick and choose things that they find interesting. And I think from there, that still gives the teacher the opportunity to like focus in on these certain situations, either with media or with like those artists, like they could do their own research on that and then kind of have everyone stick within that framework. And then eventually you can open it up a little bit more. We often also talk with students about um, coming up with ideas in relation to maybe a, a question we're giving them or something that we want them to think about. You know, we uh, we often ask students to come up with ideas and then figure out um, how to make that idea come to life, which strangely is exactly what contemporary artists do. And um, and if you let students know that you know, they need to make their idea come to life with materials that they have available or simple materials that they're able to collect. Cause I, you know, I never really want students spending a lot of money or trying to feel like they have to go out and get a lot of stuff to realize an idea. But if they have to work with, you know, pretty much what's available, especially if you're teaching virtually, um, we're often surprised at how they do make those ideas uh, come to life. You know, if teacher says we're all gonna do a painting. Well, that's what you're gonna get is painting. And if a teacher says, you know, let's just work on white paper, you're only going to get things that are done on white paper. But if we're talking about ideas and how we're going to make that idea come to life, 
that also is another way, in addition to what Alex was talking about, to, you know, to really provide some kind of choice and encourage um, different kinds of responses to the same question. I've seen some similar questions in the chat um, asking about how do we do this when we're teaching remotely or have students live and some remote, which is what I'm doing at this point in time. Um, and so um, we we were lucky enough that I had enough materials that I could put a Ziploc bag together of materials and send those home to our remote learners and then have access to supplies in the classroom through lots of different safety protocols in the classroom. Um, but I'll present like Alex, I'll divide it into different media and I'll teach this chunk of media and a lot of different ways of doing it and show a lot of different artists using it in different ways, give students opportunities to explore that media and use it. And then when it comes to the project around some big idea, they have that choice of, of media at home or in class and the addition of creative constraints this year. You know, anytime you have a project um, in a job, in real life, in the community, there are going to be constraints. There are going to be some limitations and there are going to be some requirements. And so if we, as an example, if we have to build a slide from the art room to the entryway of the school, what are some requirements that you're going to have to meet? And what are some restraints that you're going to have to have is how we kicked it off. And then we talked about in terms of if you only have these materials, you know, how do you, what are your limitations? what are your what are your opportunities to get creative and so students started pulling in objects and materials from home that they wouldn't have normally used jennifer i love how you spun that creative restraints is great like we're all living in that moment right now uh, i think it's, it's always good to frame it in a nice way um i want to ask a question that's directly about remote learning from actually another alumni of art 29 educators emily ralph hi emily um, she asks if you could share your most successful remote learning activity that gets maximum engagement. So I feel like everyone's got at least one that worked really well in the last nine months. Do you mind sharing what what happened? Yes, I can do that. I'm working with um, seventh graders at the moment. I've had I'm a, I've had one group. I'm working with the second group, and so. I wanted to work with uh, the idea of identity, which is usually what I work with with middle school students, is to get them to kind of, kind of, uh, instead of listening to what other people say about them, like who they are, to take that into account, but also then to make their own, like to kind of turn it on so that it's them kind of saying who they are. And so what I've been doing is I've been tapping into uh, astrology and zodiac. And which is really interesting because when I first thought I was kind of skeptical and thinking, yeah, this is something that I like, but the kids are going to laugh and kind of be like, what is this crap? But in a sense, they actually are really genuinely interested. Like the seventh graders are all kind of like, oh, I didn't know this says about me or this says about my parents or about my friends. And so I kind of take them through this thing where like we only have, they only have access to materials that they have at home. So like it's either something two dimensional or drawing. And so it kind of leaves it open for them to figure out how they want to do this. But we go through things like the, um, the Zodiac, the regular Zodiac, and we go through the, uh, and they create some kind of design based off of what they found out about themselves. And then we go into Chinese Zodiac. So I've shown them like Ai Weiwei sculptures. Um, and then they go into that, and then we move into this um, the five universal shapes, which is this book that talks about um, if you if you have different like if you order there's five universal shapes that exist everywhere, and then you put them in a certain order. They say something about you. Each one of those shapes represents something. So that already creates this sense of like they're doing all this research they're finding this information and then they're kind of taking it together and trying to um, say something about themselves. And they've really been really into it, except for like, you know, maybe one or two kids, but. Thanks, Alex. Anyone else have a success they want to share? Something they worked really well. We've been having fun with collaborative slideshows, you know, using Google Slides and um, doing gallery walks using Google Slideshows the way we would do a gallery walk in the classroom. 
Um, you know, one prompt I gave them recently was to, you know, to take a look at a bunch of work that we put up on a slideshow. And then um, just through comments, uh, you know, on the slideshow, visit a few of your friends uh, and classmates works and leave them a, uh, a compliment, uh, a question and a suggestion. And, um, and so they, you know, they visit a few works as if they're walking around the room, only we're in a slideshow and they're given some feedback. And then after that first round is done, it's the artist's responsibility to check out the comments that they've gotten and, and respond. Um, I sometimes give uh, in the second round, I give the artists a chance to respond out loud in conversation or to respond directly on the slideshow if they're more comfortable typing it out. So that's something that's been working recently um, just to get students used to talking about each other's work and giving everybody a chance to look at things together. Jennifer, were you on mic to answer too? Uh, yeah, I did have, I did come across something in the spring fourth quarter when we were completely remote. Uh, previously had been trying to get, encourage students to think outside of generic, the usual art materials that we all have in the classroom and how do we get them to start um, paying attention in their life and collecting and bringing objects in with meaning or pictures or sticks or um, but fourth quarter forced them to. They were at home. They didn't all have access to art supplies. And so um, after some of them started to use some of those things that they were finding in the house or around the yard, I realized, oh, what if we just require part of an assignment next year to incorporate something from your yard, something from your home, uh, whether it's uh, an image of it or the actual thing. And so that's something that I found helpful that once students had to do it, it gave me as a teacher an idea and an entryway for how do I get students to bring some of this back to the classroom with them, especially this year with the creative constraints, you have this bag with these materials, that's it, that's what you've got. And so if you, um, are stumped by that, what can you bring to the table from home? Um, I was going to share a, a strategy that I saw another art teacher um, do with her concurrent instruction where she's teaching uh, virtually and kids in the, in the room. Um, and she used an image of an exemplar artist. It was a landscape um, that was going to launch her unit rather um so this was a a very social emotional learning based uh lesson where she spent the entire class period looking closely at that image of art and she walked them through a mindfulness activity of the five senses um and so they spent the entire class time looking closely at this work of art and the kids came in and they were twitchy and excited and energetic and you could just as she moved through the mindfulness activity you could see the like the calm and and how they really settled in and they were engaging and thinking and reflecting um, with that work of art to launch to launch their art making Those are one of my favorite sets of questions to teach art with, particularly an art work from the past. Uh, but thinking about like, what does it smell like? What does it sound like? Like, what might you feel? Um, yeah, I think it's so important. And I think we rarely let ourselves go beyond the visual with a work of art. So I really like that reminder. Thank you, Amber. Um, Christy, do you want to pick an, another question for our panel to consider? Yes, we have heard a lot of successes, which is Fantastic. Um, but Ty's asking a question here about what do you do with the glorious failures? What do they look like um, when teaching with contemporary art, specifically with middle school students? And how do you get students to move on to help them and then move on? And I'm kind of wondering like what <laughs> I'm kind of wondering what what Ty's getting at by a glorious failure. You mean a lesson that just didn't go well? I, I took it and with Ty, you can definitely um, chime in here, but I took it as one of those moments that something happens that was unexpected that the student feels like is a failure, but it's actually like a good catapult for learning and pushing forward 
or it might not be what they intended, but like this beautiful moment of that's okay. And then what do we do? Mm -hmm. It's so funny. I took it as what Joe talked about in his presentation of um, like, for instance, you should always preview the film before you play it. For like, sure. did you do a failure? Was there something that you set up in the classroom and you were like, this is gonna be awesome. And then you did it and it was like, oh, not awesome. It didn't go well. So I don't know multiple, oh, Ty's answering. He's saying oh, okay. I'm more about when things go wrong and maybe not turn out right. So yeah, I think any anyone who would like to chime in and interpret that question in any way you like would be helpful. Oh, I'll share something. Um, when I was in the classroom, I did a cant funeral with my students every year. It was like the first or second class period. Um, and we would literally write the word can't on little strips of paper. And we talked about giving up in the, the, the feelings that and you can be disappointed. You can f not like your art. You can be frustrated. Um, but we're not going to give up. And so we would actually rip those cans up and bury them in a flower pot. And then I would uh, bury seeds. And then as the plants grew, we would talk about um, the metaphor of turning our mistakes into something new. And so the, the flowers were our visual reminder that we're artists and we can problem solve and we can think this through and we can, we can fix it. We can turn it into something new. So Amber, that was a good one though. That never failed. That was just a way of getting them over that hump of yeah. saying, yeah. okay, cool, just to clarify. I, you know, I think we, we wind up sometimes introducing contemporary artists that fall a little flat in the classroom. You know, we're excited to share them and suddenly the classroom or, or most of the, the students are not as engaged or they're not as excited as we want them to be. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, in thinking about Ty's question and, you know, that's, I mean, it's happened often, I'm sure to many of us, like, um, it's just important to be transparent with our kids. I, I often tell students that you're not going to love every artist we look at. Um, you're not going to love every artwork that you create uh, in this course. Some of the stuff, uh, you know, you may wind up uh, not including in a final portfolio or something like that. And that's okay. Um, you know, I do think there's, uh, there's often something to be learned from the artists we don't like as well as the ones we do like. And, um, and sometimes, you know, digging in a little bit as to what you don't like about a particular artist's work or an experience in a class, um, still in the end helps you to, to, to do some good work and to have some productive conversations and make uh, some good artwork also. So um, I don't know, I guess my, my, my gut response is just to be transparent. If a teacher notices that something falls flat to acknowledge that and not try to gloss over it and say, wasn't that lovely? Because it wasn't, obviously. You're standing there and you know as the teacher it probably wasn't as lovely as you wanted it to be. Sometimes during demos, I will purposely mess up and um, be pretty dramatic about it and then ask the students, to brainstorm what could I do in this situation uh, and have their input come towards it so they can make that connection that when it happens to them, they can brainstorm with their table team um, or I'll mess up and then in some situations with certain media show them immediately, this, these are some different ways you can fix it or move on or um, just to, so that they see us also having the error or the mistake or the, oh, this actually leads me to a new idea. Um, and when it happens to students and they're upset, sometimes I'll ask them, hey, can we share this out with the class and talk about what's happened and see if they can give us some ideas and we'll hold it up and we'll say what's gone well. And this is what happened that was unexpected and unwanted. What can we do and get those class responses? Those are great suggestions. I think, um, Emma, we have one time for one more question if you wanna pick one. Do you want to pick it or do you want me to pick it? No, go ahead. Oh, I. this is a question from Allison. Uh, she's curious about how you foster student voice and assessment, feedback, and reflection. I personally think this is such an important question um, at all levels, but I feel like maybe it doesn't always get brought into the middle school conversation. So how do you do that? 
How do you foster student voice and assessment? So I, I've been doing um, some of this work most recently in the past like couple of years with middle school students in particular is um, I've been trying, so basically getting students to, towards the end of the project when they're done, um, instead of doing like a standard presentation where they present to the whole class or, um, you know, I don't know, they have their work and then everyone can see it. Um, I, I kind of try to turn it into a much more intimate, smaller kind of thing where um, we, so together as a class, we create some like questions that they can ask each other about the work um, so that they can kind of develop like some questions and things to, to sort of evaluate each other based off of like, you know, what are the, the are the concepts and ideas that we were looking for? Did they show up in the work? Did what they learned or the, the, the techniques or media or different things that we learned about, can you see that in the work? Um, and then some other kinds of questions that they may they may kind of come up together as a class. But then what I do is I break them, I separate them into different groups, like just sort of a random association. And then in those small groups, they then sort of present to each other. And as they're presenting to each other, they're sitting there and they're kind of saying, you know, here's my work, here's what I did. And we go over the, the, the ways of, you know, how you would present. But the main idea is for them to kind of give enough information to, to their peers in a small group so that they can then ask questions and give feedback and then have time to, to write that down so they can either do it verbally or to do it in a, in a written format. And then as a small group, they do it and I just circulate through the room to see all of them engaging and talking. And then towards the end, we will then come back as a large group and just ask, you know, maybe one or two people from each group to, to share to the whole class. That way there's less pressure for them to all present and stand in front of everyone, but also they get to ask more intimate questions. They get to really understand the artwork and the ideas and they get to know their, their peers a little bit better in terms of what they're doing. And I've also noticed that in those situations, the students are a lot more cutthroat when they're in a small group, because they'll say the work and they'll say, well, well, why didn't you do this part? Or why didn't you do that part? And then it's kind of like the kids can't really lie to each other because they can see it. And so it's a very interesting kind of approach to just making it a little bit more intimate and re um, reflective. The only problem with that is that you don't get to really hear everybody talking about their work, you unless you kind of stay with each group in, you know, certain time frame, but that's kind of what I've been doing. And it, it, it seems to work. They really like it better than the other other format. I really like the idea that they get to generate the questions themselves that they'll be answering. I think that's really important for ownership. Um, does anyone else want to answer? I think we maybe have time for one more answer, not question. I don't know, Jennifer, Joe, or Amber, if you have thoughts about assessment and student voice. I mean, I like Alex's idea about putting them in smaller groups for this sort of thing, you know, um, and, and giving them a little, I mean, large group critiques with whole classes is often overrated anyway. I mean, that's just my opinion. Uh, it takes a long time and you only spend a very short amount of time on each student sometimes. So you're giving them a little bit more time to dig in. Um, on the, you know, and, and that's when they finished, you know, on the front end, I've, I've said this before in even, probably even in a previous session, you know, I love to co-create the rubrics with students and give them a voice in assessment that way, you know, after a demo is done or we introduce a unit of study or a particular project, I often ask the students, you know, so in order to do a really great job on this, you know, what are the things that we all got to look for? What are the kinds of things that we all got to do? And that's the stuff that I take note of and make it a big part of the rubric. I want their voice in the design of the rubric. Now I add things because ultimately folks forget or some simple stuff that I want them to consider, but it's really about them giving it back to me and being comfortable with what is going to constitute excellent work. Thank you. Christy, should we move on to our Yes. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about Art21's resources? 
I would love to. That would be great. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with R21 yet, I uh, hope this is your first or uh, a worthwhile introduction. We've talked about a lot of R21 artists. Uh, R21 is a nonprofit organization, and it's our mission to inspire a more creative world through the work and words of artists. Uh, we do that through several documentary series, including the long running Art in the 21st Century, which airs every two years on PBS here in the United States. And if you haven't yet, season 10 premiered in September, yep, uh, so a couple months ago, and you should watch it. it, has three great new episodes, lots of new artists to incorporate into your teaching. Uh, Tony, if you'll go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to point out the you know, variety of artists that have been featured in Art21 films, uh, both in terms of their own backgrounds, where they come from, the languages they speak, uh, but also what they create. So if you are looking to do a unit on a photographer, an installation artist, a cartoonist, there's somebody for you on the Art21 roster. Uh, so please check it out. Uh, and then Tony, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, the final thing I'd like to point out is just our education offerings. Joe and I work really hard to provide a lot of really wonderful resources for teachers, uh, including educators guides and programs like this. And the thing I'll point out or highlight the most today is our Art21 Educators Program. Uh, we're so honored to have three alumni of that program uh, present today. Uh, Jennifer, Alex, and Amber are just incredible and we're so lucky to have them. So if you're interested in you know, jumpstarting your teaching with contemporary art, uh, I encourage you to check out that program. The application for the next year will be open in late January. And you know, this year might be crazy too. So if it's not this year, down the line, keep it in mind. Um, great, well, Christy, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Emma. Um, Davis also has some really great um, middle school curriculum that's available in both print and digital books. Um, along with our popular Explorations in Art series, we have a few other books for grades six through eight. Um, a Personal Journey focuses on the experiences of artists and how their perspectives and approaches change over time. A Community Connection focuses on how groups of people use art to communicate and to connect. A Global Pursuit focuses on ideas, universal themes, and artwork from all over the world. And Exploring Visual Design is, is a dynamic introduction to the building blocks of art with each chapter focusing on a different element or principle of design. Um, in addition, Davis also has amazing resource books, perfect for middle school art teachers. Um, some of them are The Open Art Room and Making Artists, which are about choice-based art education. Um, Adaptive Art, Deconstructing Disability in the Art Classroom has tons of great adaptations for meeting the needs of learners who are differently abled. Um, fashion Fundamentals, if you have any students interested in fashion, that's an excellent one. Um, and two school arts collections that feature a curated collection of articles from School Arts Magazine, all organized and based around a theme. Um, for middle level, we have STEAM and Media Arts, so definitely check those out. Um, next slide. One other really great resource that we have at Davis is School Arts Magazine, which was actually our very first publication in 1901. So it's been around a really long time, made for art educators by art educators. Um, each issue has a feature called Contemporary Art in Context, which features a contemporary artist interview along with biographical and contextual information and some ideas for studio prompts. Um, they're full of inspiration and rich information to assist teachers and students alike. So definitely check those out. We have some really, really fun artists in there. Um, you can read School Arts Magazine for free online anytime or subscribe to the print edition. And now we'll hear from our fabulous panelists who will each share their top five choices of contemporary artists to use in their classroom. I'll turn it over to Jennifer. My top five for teaching in the middle school classroom. One is El Anasui. Um, he uses repurposed materials and uh, talks about history providing a context and that we get to continue that narrative. Jason DeCares Taylor, stunningly beautiful work. The students love his TED talk. He is uh, working collaboratively with so many different people in so many different industries to create these underwater sculpture parks that coral um, grow on and it kind of rehabilitates the habitat and students just love it. 
Um, Susan Anker uses unconventional methods. Um, she does 3D printing. Um, she'll design with nature, pieces from nature and petri dishes and then 3D print them. They're really beautiful. Um, and our kids are crazy about 3D printing right now. Um, Daniel Lind Ramos, um, societal issues and meaning and material like here with the blue FEMA tarp um, on Maria Maria, um, kind of just this idea of what what does the material mean? What does it bring to the piece? Is it helping your your story or is it pulling away from your story? And I wait way because um, he allows us to work um, collaboratively between curriculums. I'm able to work with social studies and the Spanish teacher and um, just a lot of different classroom teachers to um, talk about big topics, power and control censorship. And it just really, he does, uh, allows us to span the curriculum and make a lot of connections. Yes, and so the my top five that I like using with students are, I kind of already had them in my slides um, for the most part. Most of these are R21 artists, except for Felix Gonzalez Torres. But, you know, his work is something that you really have to stop and kind of think about it. Um, think about what's happening. Very emotional, a lot of sense of loss, duality, um, things that kind of really make you kind of stop and kind of reflect, which is why I really like his work. Uh, Glenn Ligon, again, with text and using text, which I feel like a lot of students are, are it's really accessible to them and is why I like to use him as an artist for that. Brian Jungin, because he uses really non-traditional materials to create art and, and I think it really helps kids, you know, have a strong sense of I, I can do that or I can try that or I can think differently with other materials. And then Doris Alcedo, who's very, um, her work is very emotional, very personal, talks a lot about like, you know, loss, death, Crime, you know, com crimes committed against people, and and it's it's a really uh, really emotional kind of experience. So I really love her using her work, and then Stephanie Zijuko, who is here on on this uh, slide, and her work is really interesting because she she likes to sort of do uh, play with appropriation and taking these ideas or these things, and she's here mocking, um, you know images from the Philippines of tribal people, but she just found all these materials from TJ Maxx or Ross or something like that to create the same kind of situation. Um, five, uh, five artists that I you know, really love to use, um, uh, especially with middle school students. Um, Jenny Holzer, uh, many of you probably know Jenny's work, uh, you know, her work with text is a great, uh, in, in a good way, a great provocation for students and to uh, encourage uh, discussion and art making. I mentioned Aliza before and her portrait work, particularly of uh, Mexican and Central American immigrants. Um, we've been using Aliza's painting uh, quite a bit with our ninth graders recently. Jacob Lawrence, uh, I realize Jacob Lawrence is no longer with us and hasn't been for, you know, a couple of decades now, but I continue to bring Jacob Lawrence's work into the classroom, particularly the migration series to, um, to inspire students uh, to think about the, um, uh, about interpreting history um, and looking at history uh, a little differently um, through his work. Andy Goldsworthy, uh, I think was mentioned in the chat window before. Someone had mentioned Andy Goldsworthy, um, maybe as part of one of the questions or had made a comment before, but I love um, getting students to think about photography, documenting sculpture, um, working in nature, uh, being outside. Uh, Andy's really a, a good person, uh, especially for middle school students. And, and finally, Barbara Kruger, for some of the similar reasons uh, that I like Jenny Holzer, but also because Barbara really designs the text um, and sometimes uh, really works with size in a way that um, that is exciting uh, and color. So um, those are those are certainly uh, my top five in addition to the artists that I mentioned before. All right, so um, my top five, um, Radcliffe Bailey with his personal history and he was on my slide, but he also um, is the first artist to use glitter in a way that I have really, really appreciated. Um, I don't like glitter, but 
I like his glitter. Um, Aaron McIntosh um, is also a local artist here in Atlanta. Um, and I really love the way she's an abstract artist who takes recognizable concepts for students like architecture. And, and I love the way she abstracts architecture in her work. Um, Yayoi Kusama, um, she's my favorite. Favorite, favorite, can I say that? Um, and many of my students can see themselves reflected in her, um, but also how sh I like to teach with her because she helped us think about perseverance and renewing our spirits and why to make art. Um, Roxy Payne, his um, dendroid tree-like sculptures, um, are, I find them really stunning, but I really like teaching with, with his work because of his focus on language and building new sentences and paragraphs and chapters um, to create language. And so um, really like Roxy Payne and then El Anatsui, um, like Jennifer shared, um, I also honed in on his, um, the changeableness of his work and um, his focus on multiple meanings within language. And so I really enjoyed teaching with him. Wow, fantastic. What a great selection. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna take just a quick moment to remind everyone that Davis has lots of great resources for you to access and share with the teachers that you work with. Um, if you head over to davisart.com slash free resources, you'll be able to sign up for any upcoming webinars. You can sign up for a free trial of the Davis digital platform, which includes all of the middle school books I was talking about earlier. You can also access free professional development sessions, read School Arts Magazine online, and view some of our on-demand video lessons. We've also put together some really great resources on equity, di equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as teaching art online. And we were, we are really thrilled to have recently partnered with Laura and Matt Grundler of the Creativity Department to bring you K-12 Art Chat, the podcast. Um, every Thursday, the Grundlers interview experts in the field and have engaging and insightful conversations about current topics important to art educators across the country. Um, please listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if you enjoy Twitter, um, Laura and Matt also host K-12 Art Chat on Twitter on Thursday evenings, and they would love for you all to participate. So definitely check those out. Um, and don't forget to head over to art21.org slash educators to explore all of the wonderful resources there. Um, they are really amazing, and I'm sure you'll find some wonderful segments and resources to use in your classroom. Um, please also watch our social channels for announcements about upcoming webinars and opportunities. A special thanks to Emma Nordine and Art21 for working with us to provide these webinars for you. And to our panelists, Amber, Jennifer, Alex, and Joe, thank you so very much for sharing with us this afternoon. We really, really appreciate your time and your insight. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We hope you found the session inspiring and insightful.